Hey everyone, this is Matt Wakeling and you're listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Now today I am joined by Ricky Wood of the Australian Guitar Show. Now Ricky is a great advocate for Australian guitar builders, for Australian luthiers who are doing some amazing stuff right now. Now, of course, many of us know the work of Mayton and Cole Clark, two huge names, and rightly so, in Australian guitar building, but there are so many other manufacturers, often sole traders, creating great works. And Ricky's channel does a great job of showcasing some of these builders. Today's episode is brought to you by Fretboard Biology, the comprehensive online guitar course put together by Joe Elliott. Now, Joe is not only a fantastic guitar player, he draws on his years of experience as the ex-head of guitar at the Guitar Institute of Technology and also at the McNally Smith Music College. Here's a few words from Joe about the course. If you're tired of wading through hundreds of random guitar videos and just want to become a better player, Fretboard Biology is your answer. Fretboard Biology is a self-paced, college-level program that will give you the right instruction, in the right amounts, and in the right order. You'll learn the same information I taught to thousands of other guitar players over 30 years of teaching in top music colleges. If you want to make real progress with your guitar playing, then sign up for a free 7-day trial at fretboardbiology.com. Ricky Wood, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. Well, thank you very much, Matt Wakeman. (laughs) <laughs> Mate, great. I, I feel it's fair to. I was going to say, I feel it's fair to say each other's names in full, to, so people know who we are. Yeah, for sure. Now, I don't even know why I started doing that, but I, it's, it's a thing now. So, mate, it's good to have you on the show. We've known each other for a while, and I know we've we've had a chat once or twice, um, but mostly it's been online that we've uh, um, that we've we've got to know each other a little bit and, and what you've been up to. But I want to get you on the show. Uh, particularly to talk about some of your favourite Australian luthiers because there's so many people doing really great guitar building in in this country and you've really championed a lot of those through the Australian Guitar Show and just your own uh, practice as a working musician and um, through your steps into building and I know you've done a lot of um, uh, service and and repair work on guitars too so I thought who better than to uh, talk us through bunch of great Australian guitar builders. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's many, many more qualified than I, but um, but thank you. I appreciate you reaching out to, to chat about this kind of stuff because uh, a lot of work goes into, as you know, goes into organising the simplest of things. You know, people only see an end result, not everything else that goes in behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, and, and the Australian Guitar Show was something that kind of expanded out just all based on a simple idea of thinking there's more than just the the two or three big brand names that we hear of in Australia. Sure. Yep. You know, and it was no dis you know, I never started the show out of any disrespect to those two big brands, but I was just curious. I thought, well, there's got to be more out there, right? You know, because uh-huh. I had a couple of mates who who made guitars or some pedals and things like that. And I thought, why isn't anybody really talking about these folks that much, you know? And some of these guys also mostly didn't really know where to start with promoting themselves or okay. were also of that mindset of they're, they're, they're relatively insular people who preferred focusing on creating something rather than trying to figure out how to take the right photo with the right light and yeah, send it around yeah. the world and try to become famous. You know, they just, they just wanted to to escape the world and build guitars and pedals and stuff. Yeah, for sure, um, for sure. Yeah, so I just thought, why not? Why not just tell people about that stuff then? And, that's, you know, and it all kind of just sorry. I was going to say, and that's been such a great thing. Um, yeah, I, I, you have turned me on to so many great Australian builders. Um, yeah, just by following your social media and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's such a great thing. Yeah, well, there's a lot out there, and I, I, I when I started searching, I, I was amazed at how many I found. Uh huh. You know, and and they're all guys who, uh, well, I suppose most of the guys are, uh, that I found that were building were were kind of known to an extent, obviously within their circles. Yeah. Um, but you, you know, just in in a general public sense, they maybe weren't quite as known. Sure. Uh, and, and some of them, some of them aren't even really aiming for that. Uh, yep. Some of them do want to just go. No, I just want to build five or six guitars a year and. I don't really want to do anything more than that, you know, and and that's cool. 
And then there's others with slightly larger uh, visions, you know, as I've gotten to know these guys over the, the last couple of years, you, you see some that want to do uh, more and expand out. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, just by going on online and just starting to, to you know, to try to Google or Instagram search or Facebook search all these different uh, – the try to find all these right hashtags that would lead me to different right. kind of groups and or, or different pages and then – very fortunately, as I kind of found more, they, they then kind of reach out and recommend other people to me and stuff. And and so, you know, I just ended up with this huge list of of uh, people around the country that were building stuff. And, you know, and even hunting down guys that were just doing it for fun in, in their own kind of time for themselves personally. It wasn't even necessarily about trying to find guys trying to establish a brand name. It was just about trying to find Australians that were building stuff and and um, just kind of fueling a bit of a fire there, I suppose. And it's just taken off more than I thought it would. Yeah, that's great. That's so cool. So, so yeah. we'll jump into some, I guess, a couple of uh, preambles, I guess, for me. we <clears throat> you, You've got a huge list of uh, people you know of, which is awesome. So we'll try and get through uh, a bunch of those at, as at your leisure, at whoever you want to chat about i guess those big builders obviously names like mayton um cole clark um mm. i think cole clark they've just hit the 20 year mark which is pretty amazing and, yeah right and yeah. mayton obviously a very long um history in australia so i, I guess their stories mm. are, are fairly well known so what we're, we're aiming to do today is yeah like you said look at some of these uh, amazing builders doing really cool stuff but in just a, a different mm sphere of attention perhaps for some people and um maybe draw a bit of attention um mm. so yeah i mean i know you play a maiden amongst other guitars uh, uh i like your maiden that looks like it's played a few gigs actually that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that has been uh that guitar has been through a lot of battles and wars over the years yeah, nice um and it's nothing flash you know when i bought it uh, it was actually a backup guitar to another mate that I owned. I had a just a standard 808 mm-hmm. uh, performer series, you know, with the the cedar top and, and whatever, and the uh, laminated back and sides. But and and I was up at uh, I'd lived in New Zealand for 22 years and uh, had played that old 808 for many years, kind of five nights a week in an Irish pub, uh, doing gigs there and and. I came to, I came back home to Australia in 2009 and bought that 808 with me, and then I, I started I started getting pretty pretty full on on my guitars and beating them up pretty heavily, and I kind of thought, well, geez, I, I need a backup, so I bought the um, the 808 Performer with the Cutaway, and I bought it from from Ryan at Cranbourne Music uh, just on a phone call. Uh, I just kind of rang him and said, "Have you got any decent ones here?" And he goes, "Yeah, yeah." And I said, "Well, how does it play?" And he goes, "Well, I'm not a guitar player, but one of the other guys here assures me it's nice." And I said, all right, what's your price? And he gave me price. And I said, all right, that's cool. I said, my brother will be there tomorrow with the cash and he'll uh, he'll pick it up. And he brought it up to the snow for me because I was playing up on Mount Hoffman there. And I was doing about eight shows a week on Hoffman. Wow. That, at that stage, I was doing uh, three days three days a week and uh, five nights and uh, at a couple of different venues. And uh, so, you know, the guitars were getting pretty worn out pretty quick, you know, whether it was frets or just – dealing with humidity going all over the place up mm. there and you know so yeah i got that and it, it has been through the wars my other 808 got absolutely smashed in a drunken haze one night which saddens <laughs> me to this day because it was i used to call it the terminator because i could never kill it and i eventually did uh but yeah the and then the performer has just stuck with me it's been all over the world it's been all through asia and canada and all over new zealand and flown in and out of kind of different places in Australia to do gigs and Fiji and wherever else and Bali and wherever. Uh, and I'd get bored and I've drawn on it a lot. I've drawn, started writing gigs on it and uh, it just, just, it's been played by rock stars who'd finish gigs in, in Auckland where I'd play. That they'd, they'd finish gigs uh, down the road at the big, uh, the big uh, arena there and then they'd come down and hang out at the bar I played in, you know, after midnight or whatever and so, it's been played by guys like uh, John Cougar and Neil Finn's played it and uh, Billy out of uh, Green Day, whatever his name is, because I don't like them as a band, so I never bothered <laughs> to remember his name. But the band, the band, they've autographed the guitar. Yeah, it's right. funny. Their, cool. their, autographs, their autographs are on the back, but 
I've never cared. <laughs> so I just, I just, I just thought maybe one day if one of them dies, I might make some money out of this. <laughs> so, there you go. Not really. Not really. Nice man. Well, I've, got, yeah. I've got eight guitars, um, and three of them are made in Australia. One of them's a Maton, uh, just a, a pretty stock standard two two five with a pickup and the cutaway, and um, I yeah, think about twenty yeah, years. Nice. And same thing, quite beaten up. Probably not as beaten up as yours, I don't reckon. But um, yeah, cool guitar. Let's um. Mm. Well, so, Maiden, yeah, story well known, and we we all we all love them. What? Where do you want yeah. to start? Who do you want to start talking about? And um, let's look at some other other builders. Yeah, well, look, the list is is a comprehensive one, and I don't have to go through every single brand <laughs> uh, that I've found out there. I mean, for anybody who's really interested in seeing what's out there, it's it's pretty easy to kind of. Um, I don't know, kind of use the Australian Guitar Show Instagram page yeah. as a bit of a uh, directory, I yep. suppose, uh, where people can kind of go on and just have a look at who I'm following. And in amongst uh, some of the Australian players out there, there's there's mostly builders, you know, uh, doing amps and pedals and uh, even guitar straps and, and just little offset things like stomp boxes and stuff. There's just anything, anybody making something in Australia, I just thought I'd try and, follow them and, and just keep an eye on what they're doing. Um, but the, I suppose for me, the builders that um, probably predominantly stick out for me are, are some of the guys that I connected with quite early in the piece mm -hmm. and developed a good relationship with and bought guitars from. You know, one thing I must stress with the Australian Guitar Show, uh, not that many people ever really accused me of this or, or, or suggested otherwise, but a few did. They thought I was just getting all this free stuff, you know. Right. Um, or if I demo something, they'd be like, oh, when you're finished with that, you can give it to me, yeah. And I was like, mate, I paid for this. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I took my hard-earned dollars and I gave it to the guy who made it because they deserve that money. You know, that's that's what they built it for. They, it's their, they've invested the energy. I, they get a return for that. And you know there was over, only ever a, a, a few um, a few pedals that were gifted to me, and they weren't. Uh, there was no deal kind of struck beforehand. I just did up the demos. I, I was prepared to pay. I said, "Yep, just let me know what I owe you." And, and a couple of guys said, "No, no, man, no, no, no. You just seriously, you just keep a hold of that. We really appreciate what you've done." And that was that was gratitude um, uh, that, that 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 I wasn't expecting. Sure. You know, or or asked for, so it was uh, a very very um, very appreciated thing. But as far as the, I suppose the early builders for me that uh, jumped out, I was pretty on to uh, John Parsons uh, of Parsons Guitars down in Tasmania early in the piece. Um, he was making some pretty rad little offset kind of yeah. builds and using you know all Australian woods and black woods and. And he's got this model called the Solomon, which is kind of a little bit jazz masterish offset mixed with a telly kind of vibe. And he had this one in this really awesome blackwood finish. And I, I kept teasing him, you know, oh man, you know, when when's that going to be mine? And he said, oh no, that's actually my personal guitar. You know, it's not for sale. And I was like, oh well, no worries. And for a while, I kind of kept watching his guitars, and then went off and bought some other guitars. You know, I connected with guys like. Bill Gola guitars, uh, Liam up in Bill Gola there up in Sydney. Yeah. Uh, and again, he was making this really cool little single cutaway thing with a couple of P90s in it. And uh, it was in the build process. And I said, oh, that's that my guitar looks nice, joking around, you know. And he messaged me and he said, are you serious? He said, because I'm actually building this for me, but I could probably build you another one. And, and I'm like, yeah, I, I'm pretty keen, you know. And then he kind of said, well, do you want this one? And then I'll build another one for myself when I get time. So we agreed to that, you know, cause I said, look, I love P90s, everything about it's exactly as I want. Yeah. So I kind of stole his guitar that he was building for him. You know, he'd had this dream. He'd yeah. actually envisioned the guitar in a dream and he drew it down and he sent me the original sketches and everything. And, um, you know, and I ended up uh, buying that off him and I was at a stage where I could still choose a few things that I wanted, whether what, what color I wanted it, you know, just mm -hmm. going for a natural finish and, you know, just fret sizes and all the all the cool little basic things that made the difference. And um, and it wasn't long after that that uh, uh, 
John all of a sudden says, oh, hey, man, uh, he puts his guitar up for sale. And I was like, oh, you jerk. Yeah, I, I wanted to buy that. And I'd, I'd actually, um, just before he put it, sorry, I, I'll digress there. You might want to edit that bit out. <laughs> so just as, so I'd had the Bill Gola guitar that, that finally came. That was awesome. And, and I mean, it's hard to remember all the order I got them in, you know, because I think the first Australian made guitar I bought was from Vander Guitars. Oh, and it was because okay. he was on that, he was on that little bit more of an affordable scale because he was kind of at the, the, the forefront of his building, you know, he was at the start of it and still kind of trying to get his name out there. And he'd built this guitar with a, an aftermarket neck. So he built the body and put it all together and the, the own design and stuff. But so it was more in my budget at that time. And, um, you know, and it was when I started seeing more Australian guitars, I thought I'm going to sell off some of my other guitars. And I had some beautiful other guitars, you know. I mean, I had a 1966 Epiphone Riviera, I had a 1976 uh, Rickenbacker 481, which was a, uh, a an electric guitar with the the bass shape, oh, but yeah. with uh, but with slanted frets as well. Oh yeah, I've you seen know, from 1976. Wow, that's amazing. They did, yeah, make and, I, and I had a heap of them. Sorry. They did make a heap of those ones. Yeah. No, no, no. There's very, very few of them. They actually made that model for 10 years, but they still made very few of them. Um, and, you know, I, I, I had other, other bits and pieces laying around. You know, I had a 1970 Martin D28. And, um, just a, there's all this rare stuff, all these old amps and stuff. And they all just sat there. I never used them. Uh-huh. They, they were just sitting around. And, and I, I, get really, I get really upset when I have things sitting around that I'm not using. So... And I thought, well, I'm going to sell this off and actually invest more. I'm going to put my, my money where my talk is. You know, I kept talking about Australian instruments. So I thought, well, I'll sell these off and I'll go and buy more Australian gear. And so I did. So, you know, after getting the band of guitar, kind of, that's when I started moving into stuff like uh, with, with Bill Gola guitars and, um, and getting that guitar off him. And with John Parsons uh, down in Tassie, I'd, I'd actually decided I was going to buy a guitar off him and we were going to design it together. It was going to be one of his shapes. It was this cool kind of little single cut job that he that he kind of came up with, and um, that I'd seen him him build. And so I said, "Yeah, I want one of those and these pickups and blah blah blah." And I put a deposit down on it. And then a week later, he put this Solomon of his personal guitar collection up for sale. Uh-huh. And I messaged him and I said, "Oh man, you know, like I said, that's the one I wanted from the start." <laughs> and I, I just said, how, how would you feel? And I said, I understand if you say no, I said, but how would you feel if I was to transfer my deposit onto that and just pay you the balance and, and buy that off you? And John was just fantastic. Mm-hmm. And he said, mate, absolutely, it's yours. You know? And so I paid him the rest of the money and he, and he said, look, I just want to do a few things to it first. So he, uh, I think he put new 510 tuners on it and he uh, fret dressed it and he redid the fretboard on it. Um, so actually I think that means he would have put new frets in, I suppose. And he, he refinished the front and stuff because he'd been playing it. So it had right. some marks and stuff on it. And so he just gave it a nice big refurbish, you know. And I remember the day I opened that guitar case and saw that that black wood just staring back at me. It was just one of those heart melting moments. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, and it made me so pleased to invest not just in the guitar, but into the the person behind it, you know, yeah, yeah. because it, there was something extra special about the connection with the instrument because of the connection with the builders. Mm. Yep. You know, and I think that's what the difference is between buying something that is, is perhaps luthier built or small manufacturer built versus big name factories, you know, yeah. You get to communicate with these builders and they learn about you and you learn about them and, and they you get this little bit of a, a connection with the instrument. And, you know, look, some of these instruments have been sold since um, COVID hit and since I, my wife and I decided to hit the road full-time in our caravan for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had to get practical. I had to sell a few guitars, both Australian made and non-Australian made that I realized I probably really wouldn't play much um, or ever again if, if we were going to be traveling. 
and plus also just to top up the bank after all the lost gigs and not having a normal yeah. job to rely on. Sure. So I had to make that sacrifice on a few things, you know. So I did eventually sell that John Parsons, but to a very close friend who um, who loves it immensely, and you know, I've always got first dibs uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> to buy it back, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, I did write down my little list here. You know of of all these lovely guitar builders, and Bill Gola uh, is another one of those ones who I just really connected with after buying his guitar that he was building. We ended up calling it Mufasa because his headstock design has a little bit of a, a lion's nose slash face look to it. Okay, and so we called it Mufasa after old uh, Lion King. Nice, and you know, and I've ended up owning a, a second guitar from him also, which is. Uh, kind of a double cutaway, PRS styled kind of guitar. Um, he didn't necessarily want to do anything that was directly a PRS ripoff, but uh, I had a really good friend of mine who wanted a Carlos Santana type guitar, but without paying the big money. Right. Yeah. You know, and he didn't, and he also, and he wanted to support Australian too. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he was an older older player in his seventies, and he was just. You know, he's retired and he's got the money and a lovely guitar collection. And he's like, look, I want something special. I don't want to buy a PRS. I want to own something that is made here in Australia. You know the people. Go and find somebody who can build me a guitar that's kind of in that vein, you know. Great. And so we went through that whole process and and Liam was just the choice for the guitar. You know, he was just the perfect guy for the job. And as he started building this uh, guitar, I thought, you know what, I want one in the same shape, you know, but I just want a flat top, something really simple. So, you know, I just went with a mahogany body, flat top, single humbucker, um, solid uh, bridge, uh, no bells and whistles, just really simple rock machine. You know, so he built both these guitars side by side and sent them up to us. And mine's called the Hulk because it's this uh, luminous green kind of color from the Holden Holden color range called Jungle Green, I think it's called. <laughs> I've seen the guitar. And I didn't, I didn't uh, yeah. make the, the Holden connection. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's because uh, I we were, Liam and I we probably spent he probably spent more time talking to me about colours than he did building the guitar. <laughs> and I used to say to him, "I should stop talking to you so you can actually build a guitar and make money rather than just talk to me." But um, he, he's just an, a, an awesome guy, and, and his builds are fantastic, really good quality. And um, but it is, it's just a just a straight out rock machine, you know. Like it's uh, it's very very simple, one tone, wind it up. It's got a custom wound Mick Briley pickup in, and Mick Briley's another man who I'm just an absolute fan of. Oh yeah, yep. And you know I love him. He's he's fantastic to chat to, and uh, just he really listens to what you're saying. You, you tell him what you've got guitar wise, what you're trying to achieve tone wise, and he'll send you a pickup and say, look, if it's not quite right, send it back to me, and I'll rewind it. Um. But I've never had to send a pickup back. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's always nailed it. And uh, you know, the, yeah. So I've got this custom wound Bill Gola pickup in that. Uh, sorry, a Briley pickup in that Bill Gola Hulk. And uh, the only sad part about that guitar is it arrived just as lockdown started happening. So gigs basically went by the way, especially band gigs. Yeah, yeah. And and so it's had such little playing. I. I I'd be lucky if I've spent 10 hours playing that thing before it basically got put into storage and okay. we hit the road Yeah. Um, just because there was no gigs. <laughs> so, yeah. And, um, yeah, so then there's guys like another, another guitar builder I've really connected with and really love and really encourage people to check out is a lovely man by the name of Luke Eberall. And his last name is uh, his guitar brand name, so Eberall Guitars, mm. which is E B O R A double L. And Luke is based down in Frankston. And I first met him at the Melbourne Guitar Show in 2019 when I went there to do some filming for for the Australian Guitar Show YouTube channel. And we just hit it off, you know. And I was up in the acoustic section there, and I'd, I'd made my way through the through the hall and spoken briefly to Aaron Fennec, Fennec Guitars there and arranged to meet him at a later time up in Queensland and when I was flying up there for a friend's wedding and walked around the corner and Luke was there and we just started chatting and he, 
he had his guitars on display and he had this one particular guitar, which was just beautiful. It's got a nice Florentine cutaway and had um, uh, uh, camphor laurel back and sides and this really nice, uh, I think it was a Sitka spruce top, all Australian woods, whatever it was at the top. The top is escaping me at the moment, but I'm pretty sure it's Sitka. But it was this really nice guitar and, and it had these beveled edges on it and stuff like that. I picked it up and had a strum. Now, I couldn't hear it because it's loud at the Melbourne Guitar Show. You literally kind of can't hear a thing <laughs> for bad. the whole time you're in there. Yeah. They had that 15 minutes of silence every hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so you – but even so, you'd still – you'd still not hear anything over people talking. But I, I remember holding it and strumming it and feeling it mm-hmm. uh, resonate through my body. And right there and then I was like, man, this is lovely, you know, and, and I said, oh, I've got to own this one day. And he's like, oh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, I don't know if I'll sell it, you know, I don't know, you know. And, but, and he ummed an arm. And we stayed in touch for, for, for stacks, you know, over the, over the, the following year, you know, year and a bit. And um, just as we started hitting the road in April, we, we zipped down to uh, Eberall Guitars because he had this beautiful little Blackwood ukulele. He was selling a, a baritone uke that he'd made. And I said, man, I'd, lo- I'd, I'd love to have like a nice, not really nice ukulele for the caravan when I'm traveling around, you know, something we can just sit by the fire or whatever and just have a simple strum on and sing a few tunes, you know. doesn't take up much storage space in the van. And he had this Blackwood one, and, and so he grabbed that, and I went down to buy it, you know, and I, I, I paid him for that and hung out with him and his lovely wife for a bit. And he had that guitar. So he still had this guitar uh-huh. from the Melbourne Guitar Show. And, he, and he'd explained to me, he said, oh, he said, I kind of just made it kind of just to show people what I could do. You know, he said, I've got all my typical dreadnoughts, no end bodies and, and typical yeah. acoustic shapes, but I wanted to show them something a bit flasher. You know, he said, so I kind of made it that every everywhere you looked, there was something flash to look at. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, I didn't really know where to the salad or whether just to keep it hanging on the wall or whatever, you know. And I kept saying to him, well, look, mate, I'd, I'd love to buy it. And he says, well, look, why don't you take it for a little while and try it? I said, no, I can't. He goes, why not? I said, well, it hasn't got a pickup. <laughs> I said, no, you know, I've got to be able to plug it in, you know. And I said, and besides, you know, I can't just take something without paying for it. Yeah. But he uh, he said, oh, okay, no worries. And we, we kind of traveled off to Gippsland and about two days later, he sends me a photo with an LR bags element pickup system sitting next to the guitar. <laughs> and he goes, this will be ready for you tomorrow. <laughs> like, oh, you jerk. So we had to drive all the way back to Frankston and uh, went and grabbed it, you know, and um, man, it's just a, it's a magic guitar. And he is so passionate about what he builds. He's got a full-time job and, um, you know, so he, he gets his moments where he just gets to duck into his garage there and he's, he's got this beautiful little wood collection in a, in a humidity controlled room and he's just so passionate about what he does and, he, and you know, he's a real tone wood guy. He, he'll sit there and he'll listen. You know, like those typical guys who can tap a piece of wood. Yeah, right. Yeah. He'll hear what's going on. I tap a bit of wood and go, thunk, you know, yeah. whereas <laughs> he knows what he's looking for. And, that's cool. Um, you couldn't meet a more down to earth guy. You know, he's really lovely. So I'm pretty proud to own a couple of his instruments and to have them with me on the road as we travel around. Yeah. Oh, know, and uh, the Eberall guitar is something that as soon as it gets pulled out at gigs, there's if there's guitarists in the room, yep. they just gravitate because they just want to know what's going on with it because the, the woods just, yeah, they just draw people in. That's it's pretty, cool, uh, it's pretty special. Mm. Very cool. Mm. So wow. So they actually, they made the cut for uh, for your tour for your traveling. So that, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's the yeah, so the, you the mate. Make. Yeah, my old mate is the staple. You know, it's it's the old faithful. It's the one that when I'm going to play some really tricky songs, I, I go to it because I know it'll do what I need it to do. Yep. Um, and by tricky, I mean songs with five chords. Um, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, I try to get paid doing doing gigs. So to be get paid, you gotta play those four chords, you know. You do. It's true. It's true. Yeah. For the yeah. record though, I've, yeah. I've I've seen you play, I've seen video of you play, and you, you you know more than the five chords. You can rip when you need to. Yeah, I can, yeah. 
I suppose there's probably a lot of players that are like that, isn't there? You look at so many session players, for example, who really know what they're doing, yeah. but yet they're still stuck there playing the essential because that's that's what it takes to be a busy player. Yeah, yeah. It's to know to play your part, I suppose. But when you're playing solo, I suppose because I play acoustic solo gigs 99% of the time, it's um, yeah. you've, you've got to kind of keep it pretty simple for most of it because people yeah. get bored pretty quickly at acoustic gigs. Sure. So you've got, to, you've got to keep it kind of moving moving and pumping and interesting and uh, stuff like that. And, and every now and then you just – you do something flash now and then just so that a few people go, oh, oh, that's something a bit different. And then I just go back to playing the basic chords again and yeah. <laughs> throw something in a little flash later on. You know, you, you, you take your moments rather than doing it all the time. Nice. So, there's, there's a yeah. trick you do where you detune every string. Me? Yeah. Maybe it was just a uh, one-off just... video I saw, but I saw you just ripping, and then you just like, wow, wow. You just detuned every string, at, at, like at the oh, end. Oh, probably, of it. yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I was just that was just the way I wanted to end the gig. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't play anymore. My guitar's out of tune. <laughs> I don't know. Love it, man. I think it, I was I was trying to I was trying to make it sound like a Floyd Rose without a Floyd Rose, but you can only kind of go down. <laughs> Getting back up to tune is pretty bit, That's a bit difficult. Yeah, true, <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why it's amazing when you see guys like, um, oh, what's his name, John Gom and stuff like that, you oh, know, yeah, who yeah. when they're playing and they're retuning the guitars, they're going with banjo chart style tuners. Yeah, yeah. You know, on the back of the headstock and they're tuning the guitar as they're playing. And I just think, like, I don't know if you've ever seen the video of John Gom's Passion Flower mm, yep. song. But I remember the first time I sat and watched that, I was just like, I don't, I don't see the point in playing guitar anymore. But at the same time, I was completely motivated to try and learn to play the guitar. So it was good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool, man. All right. Who else yeah. should we check out? Which other uh, Australian builders? Well, I tell you, the, 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 list, um, the list is long, but depending on what people are looking for out there, you know, there's uh, some really lovely electric builders. So obviously, I've mentioned Parsons and uh, Bill Gola. Yeah. And Vander guitars. Vander's his guitar builds have come a long way uh, since I first met him. He was so passionate about uh, building, you know, and and every time I've kind of seen one of his guitars, he's he's evolved a little, you know. He's really grown with it, and, and he's, he's he's built some really nice guitars. Uh, another guy I absolutely love is Matt Gandy of Dirty Elvis Guitars. Oh yeah, and oh, again, he's, another he brand is, that I found through you. So yeah, they look great. Oh uh, yeah, man, he's he's just cool. You know, I went and did an interview with him uh, when he was based out of in, in an area called Woodend. Uh, you know, he's now shifted from there and and hiding uh, in uh, in the ACT at the moment, I think, and then moving up to Gundagai somewhere. But look, he just builds great guitars, and I just loved his design. He had this electric guitar that looked a little bit like a classical guitar shape you know no cutaway mm -hmm. and he had a baritone that he'd built and a couple of others and i went and spent some time with him and he's just this cool guy you know like his band he's got a band called dirty elvis too nice and and that's where he took the name from he said well i already had the name and a logo so why bother trying to come up with another name for something <laughs> else he said you know it's just i'll just call it dirty elvis as well nice and um his band's great. He, he's it's just him and a drummer, and they're just just this nasty kind of cool blues rock kind of stuff. And he's just he's onto it. But yeah, his builds are great. They he's they feel really good. He's he uses really nice, good quality gear, like the hip shot gear, and gets really nice uh, kind of custom wound pickups and stuff for them. And I really like his design with his semi chamber and the way he does his. He does like a, a laid-in piece over the top that kind of makes it look like it's got this massive, big, fat binding right around the edges. He's just got this really nice, unique look. Uh -huh. And um, but yeah, top guy. So he's really worth checking out. Um, you've got guys like BK Guitars um, who are building kind of you know pretty good rock machines. You know the the kind of along those Ibanez kind of range kind of things. You've got Orpheus Guitars up in. Sydney, who Pete, I think he used to work for. Um, oh, he used to work for another guitar builder whose name's escaping me at the moment, but he's 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 building some beautiful stuff, uh, and he's a lovely guy as well. Uh, Rock Pig Guitars by Ruben. You've got uh, Conway Guitars, who's building some really cool stuff and doing some really nice overhauls on old vintage guitars as well for people. You got Little Crow, 
who builds some um, – he's got that guy, Justin Johnson, is it, that's playing his stuff, you know, the guy that played the shovel slide guitar. Oh, okay, um, cool. And, uh, you know, so he's, he's, got, he's getting a lot of attention overseas. This episode is brought to you by Fretboard Biology, the comprehensive online guitar course put together by Joe Elliott, ex-head of guitar at the Guitar Institute of Technology and the McNally Smith College of Music. I was one of the beta testers for the course and can say as a music educator, I was really impressed by the logical sequence of learning. The course has also been endorsed by players such as Brett Garson and Greg Cup. For more details, check out the links in our show notes. Just um, if I can jump in, um, yeah, the Reuben guitars, the uh, what's it, the Rock Peak? Is that what they're called? Yeah, yeah. So look, there's a couple of Reuben guitars in yeah. Australia. Well, I saw recently um, he built a double neck for Jimmy Hocking. Did you see that? Yeah, with the Mando yeah, on top Mando. and the uh, six stringer. Because Jimmy, yeah, he's yeah not between only, the two, he's not only a rock god in Australia here, but he's uh, he shreds on mandolin. So why not put them both? Yeah, together? he loves his. He loves his. Um, Jimmy's a really diverse player, you know. Yeah. Like he's obviously a very good. He loves his blues kind of stuff, but yeah, he's really into that kind of tr- traditional folk kind of blues grass kind of stuff as well. Yeah, and so he's he's quite eclectic, you know, and. Um, but yeah, that instrument's pretty cool. I don't know if you saw that video he posted where he was shredding on the Mando, yeah. <laughs> you know, with a bit of bit of overdrive on it and stuff. And um, yeah. you know, that was that was pretty cool. Um, that must have been a live gig somewhere because I know he had uh, Ben. Ben's last name escapes me at the moment, but I did an interview with Ben once in a player series interview. And ben was playing bass for him. Um, and it just sounded great, you know. It's pretty cool. But those rock big guitars are really cool because they're, yeah, they're they're just good kind of single cut, double humbucker, solid tailpiece kind of machines. And and both Jimmy and uh, Scott of uh, Screaming Jets uh, have got a few rock pigs, right? And um, between them and and they're yeah, they look like pretty awesome guitars. Yeah. But yeah, you've got two Reuben guitars, two Reuben guitars in Australia. So there's A E U B E N and A U B E N. Oh, really? Okay. And both, yeah, both guys are, are great builders. You know, Reuben A U B E N guitars. He's based in Melbourne and used to be uh, quite high up in Maiton. And I first met him years ago when I got him to rebrace my uh, my guitar because because I was tapping it pretty hardly hard i suppose some of the braces kind of came loose um so definitely not a fault of the guitar yeah <laughs> um and i got to know him through that and he's done some refrets and bits and pieces for me but his custom guitars are pretty nice as well um he does some really nice designs and uh worth worth kind of checking out yeah cool um yeah yeah have you seen ethereal guitars yeah i know the name um can you remind me what I'm doing? What they're doing? Well, uh, he's doing some really, really interesting stuff where he does like these combination carbon fiber aluminium type kind of oh, builds yeah. that look yep. really super space age. Yes, yeah. And he's got zero zero radius fretboards, and wow. um, you know he'll do multi scale type stuff and all all over the place. But his builds just look so out there. Wow, that's cool. and and yet. I, I hear nothing but rave reviews on them. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, a lot of that, a lot of his stuff sells overseas. You know, he's got all these big shredders that that play his stuff, you know, and that's oh. um, pretty cool to kind of see, you know. So that's yeah. that's kind of something that's at the opposite end of the scale of, yeah. Yeah. you know, traditional guitar building here in Australia, you know. Um, so, yeah, yeah, he's pretty cool. And then you've got all these other guys doing like kind of their own kind of quirky designs and, and kind of almost tributes to some of those old kind of K style guitars and the Italian kind of movement Okay, that happened. Um, you know, like the, you think back to the sixties with the old echo guitars and stuff like that, yeah, you know, yeah. where they'd have all these kind of like really weird offsets with lots of buttons and stuff like that. So, you know, you've got guys like Mix Wooden Wire who builds some really cool guitars using, using using aluminium necks and stuff like that, and paper plane guitars, cross guitars, harvest guitars. 
uh, build some really cool stuff with all these kind of weird pickup systems that will sometimes be behind the bridge for all these oh, compensated wow. notes and <laughs> resonating notes and stuff like that. And nice. So there's just there's just so much out there to kind of embrace and find. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can kind of find a bit of everything. You know, you can find your real traditional telly based kind of players that just are builders that just make these great, solid, does one or two thing kind of guitars. And then there's guys out there that are just going real left of center and making stuff where you just think, what the heck are you thinking? You know, like, <laughs> and, and just expanding. Oh, I love it too. Mm-hmm. It just expands the instrument so much further. It's brilliant. Yeah. Very cool. So, yeah. Mm. Nice. And then you got your, I mean, your acoustic guys, man. There's some some guys out there that are doing stuff that, you know, for me, for, me, for, for years, you know, you look at an acoustic and you, you look at an old typical D28-looking acoustic guitar from nearly every brand. And then you start seeing guys like, uh, like I said, with Eberall doing all these rolled over kind of contoured edges and, um you know, and, and builders like uh, Billy Tarrant down in uh, Tassie and um, I was one of the other guys I was thinking of that I've been loving his work that I've seen lately is, and I'm not too sure how to pronounce his last name, it might be Palele or Palele, it's P-A-L-E-L-E-I, guitars. And, you know, some of his designs and wood selections and stuff like that, are, they're art pieces. You know, just these really highly functional art pieces. Yeah, wow. You know, and uh, yeah, and then you got all your amp builders. <laughs> it's it's it, it kind of be, almost be over a little bit overwhelming to try and compress everyone into an interview if I was trying to actually list off every yeah, single name sure. that I that yeah. that's on the list. You know, yeah. I really encourage people to go and look at the the Australian Guitar Show Instagram page. And, who I'm following because you will find just so much stuff there. Totally. And all those names you've mentioned, pretty much whenever you highlight someone, if I see the post, I'll just follow them straight away. Um, yeah. Just to check out what, what's going on. And there, there is so much, so much good stuff. I might, yeah, um, there really is. I might jump in, um, tell you about a couple of builders in New South Wales that, that I, that I know. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, this is happening more and more. Um, people, I, I mentioned the guitars hanging behind me, which is terrible podcasting. But um, or people, <laughs> or people bring it up and they go, "One sec." Anyway, a couple of quick uh, builds on a highlight. Um, Pat Keegan is a guy from the sort of the, the mid south coast of New South Wales on Aladala. Pat's a lovely Aladala, Aladala mate. Pat's a lovely yeah. guy. Uh, this is um, one of his earlier builds, sort of like Vander when he started building. He was just doing bodies. Um, but he's been making yep. necks for the last few years. So he makes great, oh, lots of different types. But the guitar I bought off him was a, a he calls it a Tele Master. It's like a like an offset with a Tele wiring. Um, I think this was his first um, semi hollow. And uh, he's, nice. we're just talking about him building me a neck now that he's getting into necks. Um, so that's awesome. I love that guitar. And yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I really dig it. Um, and then he's a really lovely guy too. He's a beautiful guy, Pat. He's just yeah. a lovely guy. So we met through mutual uh, friends. Actually, his son and his daughter-in-law I knew um, through a church I was attending. And, um, yeah, cool. So his daughter-in-law posts, oh, here's some guitars Pat's building. And then it's, again, just that one click. And, um, yeah, we just started talking. And, uh, yeah, he's a lovely bloke. He's, um, yeah, builds cool stuff and, and always good to catch up with. So it's like you said about... Um, building a relationship. So whenever I play this guitar, I think, oh, yeah, Pat built this. And you, you think of the conversations yeah, that's... you've had and it's yep. great, man. It's so good. And likewise, Bit of magic, man. Yeah. Likewise, um, I've got a Gosball Strat over here, which I got built a year ago. So I guess COVID, no gigs. Last year, I, I sold off all these guitars I didn't want to play anymore. Um, just fairly cheap uh, guitars that I've tried to fix up with new parts and things, and I sold off a few mm. things, sold a few pedals, and I've um, had this built, and it's just the ultimate um, for me mix of vintage and modern Strat stuff. So um, when mm. when gigs started for a little while this year, that that's been my main sort of gigging guitar. Um, yeah, is that Mark Gosbell? Was that his name? Yeah, that's Mark. Yeah, yep. 
Yeah, yeah, right. I've seen his stuff. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to uh, talk to him or uh, reach out to him at all. But um, yeah, I've seen a seen a few people kind of raving about his guitars. Yeah, well, he. Um, so yeah, so sorry. Sorry, I was jumping in on top of you. Sorry, he. So he doesn't do heaps of building, but he has in the past done um, acoustics and lap steels, which sort of got him in yep. the in the door. He, he mainly builds for his own enjoyment these days nice um, yeah but we'll still sell off stuff or take commissions um but same same story when, when i play this guitar i think well that's guitar mark built for me and and we're, we're good mates and um there's yeah it's i think it's one of the great things about music isn't it the connections that you make whether it's on stage yeah playing a gig with with your mates with people mm. you love being with or or the other connections which um which i know you're big on so i, li- I like that well, sense. there's something pretty special about somebody who can make some wood and wires connect with where our, uh, dare I say it, maybe our spiritual uh, sense kind of comes out through music, you know, for a lot of us. Whether you're sure. playing covers or originals or whatever, you, you're still somehow getting a bit of your spirit out there. And when, when you can take something that um, and connect with, like you're saying, connect that relationship with somebody that has built something specifically for you mm. um it, it is something that that just i don't know I, it just it does just make something a little bit more extra special and you can't really explain it until you've experienced it i suppose and it, it might even sound corny to say uh like i am but you know i've owned a lot of lovely guitars in fact my the list goes over 450 guitars but Whoa. um Far it's out. a bit stupid, mate. <laughs> it's a bit stupid. Not all at the same time. But I ran guitar stores for 15 years, okay. so I was constantly buying and selling, just yeah. constantly, right. just turn over, turn over, turn over, turn over. Some pretty rare guitars in there too. But, you know, the ones that I've, I've really connected with where I've been involved with a part of the design, it's like saying when you're kind of really talking to the person and kind of yeah. laying down the nitty-gritty of kind of searching your own mind and thoughts about what do I want mm. Um, and that person makes each and every little thing specific for you. You know, it's not like when you're walking into a shop and you kind of might compromise something for the sake of getting yes. what you what is close. Yeah. You know. Um, you know, I think about how many guys go and buy guitars and then they go and change everything on it. Yeah. And by the time you do that, I think, why didn't you just buy a custom guitar? Because you've spent another eight hundred bucks on pickups or whatever, and you've spent another four hundred bucks on replacing tuners and bridge and Jack outputs and yep. tone pots and all that kind of stuff. And you think, why didn't you just buy a custom guitar? <laughs> you know? But that that so that Gosball guitar you've got there yeah. that's based on like a sixty strat. Yeah. So um, yeah, sixties kind of vibe. One thing I realised this old brown thing here. It's it's called the Madocaster. It's a parts guitar I put together in the early nineties, and I yep. did I didn't know at the time, but it had a it had a vintage bridge which is a little bit wider on a strat than. Um, I think, I think in the early '80s, Strats went to a slightly narrower uh, bridge yep. spacing, and that makes a huge difference in how a guitar feels. Um, mm. So when I realised, oh, this is why I don't like new Strats, but I love all the custom shop Strats I've ever played, but were way beyond my means um, to buy get mm. a custom shop Strat. It was oh, okay, it's a bridge, um, not just the bridge, but a big deal. So that's when I started. Okay, I'm going to sell off a few guitars. I'm going to get some hardware together and, and whatever. And um, just chatting to Mark about it, 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 one thing led to another. He, he offered to drill out one of my bodies to fit a vintage bridge on there. And, yep. um, yeah, eventually said, why don't I just make something? And, and we, we took it from there. So, But, yeah, 60s, nice. 60s uh, lots of 60 specs. Um, although the next got a 12-inch radius, medium jumbo, so more of a modern thing there. It's got the yeah, nice. the heels being cut away, like you know some of the the Strat Ultras or whatever. So the upper fret yep. access is really cool. But you look at it and it looks it looks very vintage. Yeah, you wouldn't know to look at it, and from and just like all your viewers, all your listeners will be thinking, "What the heck are they <laughs> are talking, talking about?" about? Um, yeah, what well, pickups did you run in that? So I've got in the neck. There's a, a Seymour Duncan SSL one, which is a very vintage kind of bright single coil. Um, mm. and in the bridge, it's a, uh, it's a stacked, it's an STK nine, I think Seymour Duncan. Yep. So a really hot, it's really a stacked single coil. It kind of behaves 
still behaves a bit like a single coil, but it's got a very thick mid range as well. So yeah, it's all right. rocks. Yeah. So uh, for me, I like the idea of it looking very vintage and old school, and um, and yep. it's a little bit hot rodded, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the hot rod thing's a great way to go. But exactly like you, you said, know, I mean, you know, to the only other way to get a strat like that um, is yeah to do a, is to do a custom. Um, yeah, you know, if you want certain quirks for me to get a vintage style bridge, but I still want a flatter radius neck, um, mm. I've got some particular pickup ideas. It just may it mm. just it just works to do that first rather than yeah, absolutely something else. and. You know, I'm, for all the years that I ran, um, I, I lived in New Zealand for 22 years. I moved over there when I was fairly young. And mm-hmm. I, like I said, I managed music shops there for about 15 years. And I worked for one store, which was probably one of the, in the in the mid-90s there, we were like the prime uh, Fender custom shop uh, uh-huh. to come to for, for ordering custom guitars because uh-huh. the owner was a Fender freak and a vintage freak. I mean, we had more vintage guitars than you could you could think of, you know. He had all he had all this stuff just before the boom too. So you know when all okay. that when Jacksons went and kind of basically kind of pushed the market way up crazy with yeah. L series strats and stuff. Out came the collection from under his bed. You know, <laughs> like it was just amazing how much stuff he had. That's cool. Um, but but you know we, we we did a lot of these custom shop orders, and you're thinking even back then people were still spending. I suppose in the mid nineties they were they were putting down four and a half grand. You know, it's probably quite equivalent to seven and a half kind of grand now yeah wow and and you think well you know some people go oh, i get it because it's an investment you know if i ever decide to sell it blah blah, blah. it's like you're still going to lose a lot of money either way yeah yeah you know just because it's you know unless you're buying something that was a limited edition run or that that yeah. just became stupidly collectible but if you go in custom shop there's a good chance that you've then still got to find that person who wants exactly what you wanted yes um, you know, and, and you're still going to sell it probably for a couple of grand less than you ever paid for it and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, because I've had people say to me, why invest in an Australian one, you know, when I could spend the same money on a, a factory USA guitar or whatever and, and maybe not lose money? And I'm like, well, then you maybe you're buying a guitar for the wrong reasons. I don't know. But, but you know, I'd, you'd sit there and say, look, you, you could go spend seven and a half grand on a USA-made custom shop or you could save yourself a few grand or more, mm. and get somebody here in Australia to make you something really special too that, you know, supports another Australian and keeps money here in our country and that person probably pays tax too. I think most of them do. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, it, it's just that that maybe I, I should have hung out with Dick Smith a lot more in the 90s when he was really in that buy Australian mode because, you know, people are starting to see it now. Mm. And, and, you know, to be able to have a guitar that if something goes wrong with it also, you could go, oh, hey, man, you know, this just happened. You know, what can, can you fix that for me or whatever? Yeah, and sure. they might be around the corner or not far away to be able to sort your guitar out for you, you know. And whereas sometimes you, you deal with some of these uh, guitars that are new these days from the big manufacturers, they just don't care. They are literally the equivalent of car manufacturers. You know, you've got people working on factory lines that just – well, their job is just to put that screw in and then it goes on to the next person. Some of them don't even play instruments. They don't have a connection with it. They don't, they don't get a toss. They just how it goes, you know. But a Luvia built thing, you've got somebody connecting with the instrument from the start to the end. Yeah, right. And yep. it really makes, to me, that makes a really big difference to the value of the instrument and to the end result sure. of the instrument. Because if something's not quite right, they pick up on it, you know, whereas – Somebody down a factory line may not see the fault that somebody made three steps back because they're just focusing on their one thing. And most of the quality control stuff doesn't even it just they just go, Oh yeah, it's there you go, it's together, that's good, out it goes. Right, yeah, yeah. And I worked I worked for Australis Music for a couple of years in New Zealand as a sales rep for Ibanez, PV and Tama and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And serviced the 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 North Island as a sales rep. And um, you know, for a while there, you know, I'd I'd on my two weeks when I wasn't on the road, I'd be in the warehouse and, and doing guitar setups before they went out to shops. And man, the amount of work I had to do to make them playable. Really? Not all of them, but a lot. Okay. A lot of those guitars needed some major tweaking before they went out because they just didn't care. Right. At the factories, they don't care. It's like expecting to buy a brand new car off the lot and expect it to be this amazing thing. They, they don't care. They, they, 
they don't, they've just sent, sold it to a dealer and the dealer sells it to you and then that's it, you know, and then they put you on a service plan and on it goes. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, so there's no real passion there, but, um, you know, but yeah, yeah, there's, there's just, I can't say it enough really. There's just something special about owning something that is made by somebody you can talk to and, um, and for it to be Australian is just a, a real added bonus for the, for the industry and for the economy in a sense. Yeah, sure. Anyway, I've waffled a bit there. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's good, man. I'm, I'm, I'm on edit, board. Edit, edit, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm, I'm on board and I'm lucky enough to be, you know, engaged in that space a little bit through those couple of guitars I, I mentioned. Um, mm. uh, yeah. And I guess we've got listeners in other countries too, you know, there's going to be local builders um, that might be worth checking out. And, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think... Um, I've seen a, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head because it's been a while since I looked, but I do remember a few Australian builders that had overseas buyers. Um, I know. You know, um, just some. Like Ormsby over in Western Australia, he, he's made some inroads. Oh, big time. Yeah. Uh, big time. He, he has done some great work for championing Australian made stuff. And of course, he's, he's obviously also has his overseas manufactured stuff now too. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's Patrick, isn't it? Patrick Ormsby, I think is his name. Uh, Perry. Perry, Perry, there you go. Edit. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Perry Ormsby is somebody who has really gone out there and, and made quite a significant difference to the Australian market. And he's, he's focused on his, his branding and his product and he's had a real goal right from the offset. Mm. You know, I remember actually the, the bit, the, uh, I remember most of that I simply know through your interview with him. Oh, okay. Yep. Because um, you interviewed him oh, it'll be a couple of years ago now, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, quite a while ago now. I think um, I'm not sure how far into the overseas marketing uh, building he was going, but he was definitely on his way with it as well yeah, as his own yeah, custom he was just, shop. That's right. Yeah, he was just on the cusp of it. I think he was um, – I think he'd only had those overseas manufactured products for, for a very short time at yeah, that stage. Yeah. But he, and because I, I think I remember him talking about how specific he was about going to these factories and really working closely with those mm. people to ensure that they upheld his goal of a quality product. Yeah. And, um, you know, and that, that, that does make a big difference. And uh, for him to have that vision that was, he could have surely stayed being just a custom shop builder who mm. just did a few things here and there, but he had a bigger vision and that's cool because he was, he had the uh, the know-how and the determination to kind of work towards that and got good guidance and, you know, he's building pretty cool-looking guitars too, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah, definitely for that. He's got some cool stuff. That corner of the, the market he's he's into, that that really hard rock yeah. angle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Angle. Yeah, the shredder, the shredder genty people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it works well. Hey, one, some good stuff there. One more shout out from me is uh, Charles Cilia in in Sydney as oh, well. Absolutely. Now I've never bought now, a Cilia, and he's, he might be out of my market, um, but I've met him a, a number of times. He's, he's done some um, he's done some uh, work on my when he was when he was building guitars out of his garage. He used to live near where I did, so he did some um, setups or some repairs or something on some of my stuff. Mm. But um, but I got to know him through Michael Dolce, who's Fantastic Australian guitar player, um, playing on the oh, voice yeah. at the moment. I think I think it's still yep. going. It's it's his tenth year doing that show, and he's um, yeah he's playing wall to wall cilias, man. It's it's awesome. Yeah, um, great Charles, guitars. I've actually got to watch the voice. I think it's at the grand final stage, and and a good mate of mine is in the grand finals. Oh, okay. Um, I shouldn't say good mate. We we, we you know because I don't want to make it sound like we're best friends and hang out all the time, but. Mick Harrington's uh, a lad from my area where I okay. grew up. Very cool. And, uh, you know, Mick's bought guitars off me and I've done a, a couple of uh, setups and, and stuff like that for him. And, um, you know, we've spoken a lot about PA systems in the past and we just get on really, really well. And I'd, I'd try and sneak along and watch him sing wherever I could because nice. he was this guy who was a behemoth. You know, he was this big guy who, who did boxing and, and was just out there working in the woods and, you know, mowing lawns and just, but yet he'd start singing and you'd be like, no, that, that can't be him singing. That's, that doesn't, that doesn't suit, that, that, that doesn't match, you know. 
it's this huge guy with this, this beautiful voice, you know, and uh, just a lovely, lovely guy. And uh, so when he first messaged me, say, oh, hey, look, I've, I've gone on The Voice, you know, I was like, oh, that's cool, we'll see where this goes. Yeah. And here he is in the grand finals, oh, you wow. know, I think, I think or, or down to the, the last four or whatever it is. Okay. That's and cool. uh, yeah, so I've actually got to start watching it because I don't normally, I don't, we don't have mainstream TV in our, yeah. on our trip. We don't have anything. Yeah. <laughs> we just stream the occasional thing if we want to and that's it. But uh, yeah. Oh, that's cool, man. But yeah, Charles, Charles Cilia or Chilia. I can't remember how he pronounces it. Yeah. Oh, I think I'm getting it wrong. But I, but I met him, I met him uh, at the guitar show in 2019 that's as well. Right. And like I said, just yeah. absolutely lovely guy. Yeah. And, and the best thing he did was say to me, find the guitar on the wall that you dislike the most and play it and let me know what you think. <laughs> really? And he had, yeah, yeah, he did. He just said, find the guitar that you think wouldn't be you. Right. Basically. He said, just, just go for the one that would be not what you want, you know, and, I, and just play that. And he had this one which was kind of his single cutaway kind of, uh, you know, uh, shape with with a Floyd Rose on it and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and you know, I mean, I like anybody and from that grew up through the eighties and nineties. I used to love Floyd Roses and had stacks of guitars with them. But after mm-hmm. doing years and years and years of acoustic gigs, you you eventually just don't miss them anymore. So every guitar I've got is is solid tailpiece. Okay, but um, but uh, yeah, yeah, he, he I grabbed this thing and played it, and mate, it was heart melting. It was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> like I walked away thinking I could do that. I could. I could own. I could own that. You know, I could. I could buy that guitar. You know, but um, so he had the right. I thought that was a really cunning, uh, cunning way to drag somebody in. Was say play the guitar you think you dislike the most, and um, and I thought, well, if I dislike that the most, geez, I could only imagine what it'd be like if I got something uh, made by him that was exactly what I wanted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But, but yeah, lovely guy, and his um, journey with with how he connects with his woods, and uh, that sounds rude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how you know how he uh, is he really specific about what he buys, and and mm. you know how he four plans for his uh, for his builds. Pretty good, pretty onto it. Ch- Ch- it was interesting when I when I met Charles. I'd been uh, he was getting an amp built by a friend of mine. Uh, under the Barry uh, Barry Marie's his name, and he builds amplifiers under the name Barwatt. And Barry used to live around, or Barry still he still lives around the corner from where I used to live. And so I'd I'd had amplifiers serviced by Barry, you know, some old valve amps, and and I'd been around and interviewed him on the show, and um, used to go and demo his amps and stuff like that. And he builds ripper amps. He, his amps are killer. And and he's just the most lovely, humble guy. He's still got a day job, so he just does it in his spare time. He grew up with his dad building amplifiers and doing repairs, and so it's just in in his blood. And um, Char, uh, uh, he was building a guitar for, uh, guitar amp for Charles, which was like a replica of an old. I think it might have been a replica of an old Bad Cat or something that Charles had. Okay. And Charles always wanted a replica of it, and he had a couple of people try, and it just never was quite right. But um, but Barry Barry had his own take on how to kind of get these particular tones out of it and built this amp, which just blew Charles away because he wanted it in a head version, I think it was, from memory. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, so, yeah, in the in the amplifier world, you know, because, of course, there's that whole realm as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you're talking about guys like Dave Ulbrich and yeah. um, MI Audio. Is it MI Audio? I think yeah, they're... Yeah, Michael Ibrahim, who's, yeah, another yeah. behemoth in that separate world, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and guys like uh, uh, Brookfield, uh, Brookfield Amps, man. There, Ruben is this uh, lovely guy who built some beautiful amplifiers, and um, you know he's done a couple of real kind of uh, British-based type, kind of class A, kind of thirty watt amps and one watt amps and ten watt amps and stuff like that. Uh-huh. You know, and he, he just. He's based out in Melton, just out of uh, just north of Geelong, and and just a, a lovely guy who builds these beautiful amps. Hit hard times a little while ago. He had his computer stolen, and unfortunately, it had all his schematics on it. Oh wow! Everything he'd ever designed. So he had to really kind of step back and 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 rebuild again. Like well, that was that was really tough, you know. And I only recently saw. I stay in touch with him, and I only recently saw that he kind of uh, 
started building another amp again and, and doing bits and pieces. And I was pretty stoked to see that because I, I was worried worried there for a little while that a setback like that plus a bit of COVID lockdown on top of that could could kind of could you know under under very understandable circumstances make somebody go well no I'm just going to have to give up on that and focus on other mm. things to survive you know yeah um, but he's he's still doing it and I think that's that's uh, that's really good to see you know that bit of resilience that people have shown through times excuse yeah. my language. Uh, to continue building and, and doing what they're passionate about, to kind of keep their spirit alive a bit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm. Mate, there's one more builder I want to talk about before we wrap up. I mean, we could, we could, like you said at the start, we could talk uh, for weeks on this. Um, no doubt. <laughs> wasabi Guitars, you are, uh, you started. <laughs> wasabi. <laughs> Wa- <laughs> wabi Sabi. <laughs> okay, let me say it again. Let me say it again. <laughs> No, don't. I like wasabi guitars. Really? I, yeah. <laughs> nah. I'm thinking of sushi, aren't I? I can, I can see why it's confusing. Wabi sabi. <laughs> wabi sabi. Okay. What does that mean? Uh, wabi sabi is kind of uh, finding kind of acceptance and appreciation in imperfection. Oh, nice. Which I'm really good at imperfection. <laughs> We all are. I'm perfect at imp- I'm perfect at imperfection. Now it was. Uh, I just did a bit of research on. Um, I mean, I love Japan. I've been up there a few times and used to go up there skiing in the, in the winters, you know, or our summers. I'd I'd head north and go skiing up there and play gigs up in Japan. And um, uh, you know, so I just really love the Japanese culture and the people. And and so, you know, there's that. Uh, although the name's going to escape me at the moment off the top of my head, but there's that art of you know, in Japan where something was broken and they kind of put it back together using gold leaf and, and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I knew I wanted to, I knew I wanted to muck around with learning how to make a guitar, you know, just for something to do. And I'd had, had started a course several years earlier to do an acoustic guitar build, but life kind of took a little bit of a change for me at that time. And so I had to just kind of stop and which I was only a class in a couple of classes in building this acoustic guitar thing. And that guy ended up kind of folding his business and disappearing anyway. So I was probably lucky to have gotten my money back at that time. And, but, um, the, so it was constantly in my mind to eventually want to do a building course and COVID hit and, you know, I was doing online streaming gigs and stuff like that. And then, uh, during the lockdowns and, and then I noticed, there was a guitar building course by a guy called David Searle, um, who does uh, David Searle guitars, or I think he sometimes goes under DJS guitars, but uh, he's got a couple of pages on Facebook and I follow both of them. I think there's uh, guitar building courses uh, by David Searle. And, but if, if you basically go onto my Instagram account and type in S-E-R-L-E, uh, his couple of pages that he runs will be on there. But the guitar building course is one. I'd, I'd seen, you know, pictures of guitars that guys had built, and I thought, geez, everyone's coming up with some pretty nice results there, you know. And so I, I gave him a call, and he said, look, mate, why don't you pop around and just come and have a chat for half an hour or so and just see what you think, you know. We'll see if we connect, and if, if I'm the right fit for you, then cool, you know. So I went and chatted with him, and, and we did. We just hit it off, we, and we just had some things in common, and, uh, you know, he was able to show me what he'd built and what other people had built, what was in the progress, and and he gave me a lay down of how it works. You put down a little bit of a deposit, and you you work until that's kind of chewed up, and then you put a little bit more money down, and you work till that's chewed up, and then as you kind of get to the end, you, you you do a little bit of work and then pay what you've done. You know, so you're not you're not overpaying for anything. And he right. said, look, he works it on an hourly rate rather than just a set fee, because you're also building what you want, not what he's telling you to build. Right. Yeah. You know, he just basically says, here's the tools, here's the know-how, here's my knowledge. Um, I'm going to show you how to do this little bit and then you take over and finish it off. And So he doesn't just sit there and, and do the build for you, but he also doesn't ignore you, you know, and he doesn't just confine you into saying, you're going to build a Telecaster and here's everything pretty much pre-made and stick it together. Yeah. <clears throat> you do everything from a bare piece of wood. So I started that course and we got one lesson in. I cut the body shape out. And then the next lockdown happened, which ended up going on for months and months on end. Okay. So I started going a bit crazy, like a lot of musicians and, and creatives did uh, during long periods of lockdowns. 
And I was at home and I had some bits of wood laying around that I'd, I'd picked up over. Is that Mr. Whippy going past your yeah. house? Yeah. Oh, man. Go get some. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> You know, it's you know, you know, the weather's turned when Mr. Whippy's out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so so I had these bits of wood laying around because I always wanted to kind of get around to building something, and I had this beautiful piece of black wood that I'd picked up in Harrietville, and, um, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to make a guitar. I'll start off with a, a tally, and I, I went and bought some basic tools, and uh, very fortunately, due to the, due to knowing so many of these different luthiers through doing interviews and stuff with them. Mm. I was able to reach out to guys like Liam from Bill Gola Guitars and Luke from Eberall. Dirty Elvis was on the hand a lot. Vander gave me a bit of help. Uh, Aaron Fennick of Fennick Guitars up in Queensland who in Miami, man, he does amazing stuff. Great, great guy. And he was so helpful to me as well with just communicating online and sending me photos and information and giving me really good encouragement when I'd send him photos of what I was doing. But I, I basically just thought I'll build a, a tally style guitar and I'll take it off with a little bit of my own kind of shape. And it came out all right. You know, I built the neck from scratch and I bought uh, the only pre-made stuff was uh, I bought a pre-made slotted fretboard from Stumac because uh-huh. I didn't have the fret slotting material there. Yeah, and I thought, sure. well, I'll, I'll, I'll buy a pre-made fretboard. And, uh, and, and then obviously the hardware, you know, and I got Mick Briley to wind me up a custom wound kind of, uh, filter Tron type pickup, which he called the Moggy and, uh, which is only about a 4.7 K output, but man, that thing just wow. screams. It is a ripper pickup. And, you know, the guitar had a bit of a knot in it. So I mucked around with putting some resin in it. I put some tiger's eye in it. And yeah, the, the neck cool, on it. Man. Is, that looks awesome. The neck came out a bit bit V-shaped, you know, because I hadn't learned how to re- uh, round the neck off properly at that stage. But to be honest, I quite like the V-shaped neck anyway. Mm-hmm. It still gave it a bit of a vintage feel and um, it, it plays really nicely. It came up great. I had some problems that I encountered during the headstock, uh, you know, with just the, the, the uh, router slipping out on me at one stage and nearly to the point of ruining the whole thing. And I sent photos to mates and they were like, Whoa, that's done. You throw that out. Oh, I was like, no, I refuse to lose, you know, <laughs> and I made it through. I, I, I completed this guitar, you know, and it, and it came up great. And, um, well, I thought so anyway, and, and a few others who have played it have really enjoyed it. And as the lockdown went on further and further and further, I decided, well, I'm going to build another guitar. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I came up with a second design, which was kind of like a, a bit of a, an offset classical shape, a bit influenced by Dirty Elvis. Um, so it was kind of to look like it didn't really have a cutaway. Um, and, but, but just, I don't know, I kind of combined uh, a bit of my maiden shape. I traced around one side of the maiden and then another side around a three-quarter classical I had lying around. And nice. I just drew up a shape on a, on a piece of wood until I was happy with it. And then I just started cutting things out and I made, I made that guitar mostly without the use of power tools. So nearly everything on it was, was oh, using yeah. just old rasps and chisels and old uh-huh. school techniques because I had the time, <laughs> I had yeah. plenty of time. And, and I thought, well, if I'm going to be on the road and, and I've got the opportunity to make a guitar while I'm traveling around, I, I need to be able to do it with minimalist tools and without power. You know, and so um, so I was kind of giving myself that uh, ability to kind of learn how to do some things without the requirement of uh, power all the time because I knew I wouldn't have it while we're out camping. Yeah, not not two forty volt anyway. Mm. And uh, yeah, so I built that by hand. And look, it's a heavy guitar. It, it was a chunky piece of wood. It comes in at about four and a half kg bracket, so it fits in that Les Paul kind of weight. And again, I've got a couple of uh, Briley custom wound pickups for it. And, uh-huh. I imported a, uh, a Schroeder bridge from the States for it, which is just like a tally bridge, but with just a bit of a fancy look to it. And it's got the fattest neck. It's got a huge neck. Like I've got an original 1938 Dobro, uh, a national Jewelian, and that's got a big neck. That's, that's really big, mm-hmm. you know, and the neck on my thing's even bigger than that. <laughs> and I know guys who have got those, uh, you know, like uh, the 54 and 56 Les Pauls with the baseball bats. Baseballs, yeah. And they still say that they're, they still say that my neck's bigger than that. <laughs> so I could probably cut about a kilo of weight down if I just just shaved the neck down to a normal size. Yeah, yeah. You know? 
but look, it's come up great. You know, there's a few little indiscrepancies, you know, like when I did things, I'd, I'd, you know, like doing my dot inlays and stuff like that. Sometimes you'd be just a fraction of a mil off because you're mm-hmm. doing it by hand. You know, you, yeah. I cut the whole neck shape using pull saws and, and sand it all by hand, you know. So there was always going to be that potential for slight discrepancies, but that's the joy of something that's handmade. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's not precision built. Um, to play it, super comfy. It came up great. Like it, it, it plays really nicely. It's got great action. The tone is, is ripper. It's got sustained for days. And, um, you know, I've played it at gigs and with the bands and stuff like that at the, in, in the occasional moment, we've had a, a, a gap in the, in the, in the lockdown to be able to do a gig and it was killer. I loved it. Yeah. You know, so I really enjoyed it. And very fortunately, I've been able to almost finish my build at Cell guitars, which is kind of like your Pat Keegan tally master there. Okay. It's an offset kind of tally vibe with extended horn, you know, nice. a, bit, a bit, bit longer in the shoulder and in the bum. And, um, you know, that's just running a couple of Mr. Fabulous Filtertrons in it. And I've built a 27-inch scale baritone, um, you know, which we've put graphite reinforced neck in. And, again, that's got a really chunky neck on it as well. Um, but that's all painted. But, I, I, again, lockdowns happen and because we've been on the travels. I've just been fitting it in when I can be back in Melbourne. Sure. And that's that. David, David and I kind of talked about a great colour for that, which is this really awesome kind of tangerine metallic kind of finish it's almost like a uh an old gretch orange finish but with a metal flake under it um so it really pops with it it's almost like got like a bit of a gold look through it too and um so i can't wait to get back and finish that nice. but again we can't really go back into melbourne yet we can go back in but then we can't get out yeah. so we basically would just have to stay put until they kind of really lower restrictions in melbourne yeah. it's just hanging in his workshop there waiting for me to return <laughs> You know, so Wabi Sabi is not something I really ever intended on uh, becoming a builder that sold guitars to people or anything like that. But I wanted to give it a little bit of a keepsake name. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm really glad I stepped into the process because it furthered my bond with a lot of uh, the luthiers that I, I, I own guitars from. And it, encour- it helped me through a really, really dark period because the live stream thing was eventually doing my head in. Right, yeah. Because you can only you can only play to a computer screen for so long. Yeah, sure. You know, when I'm I'm used to feeding off the energy of an audience, yeah. you know, and um, and and so I I like a lot of guys I, uh, and, and girls out there as creatives, you kind of just you, you after a long time of being locked down, and it's interesting talking to people in other states at this stage back in October, November kind of time because. New South Wales and Queensland had, had experienced lockdowns on a shorter period. Yes. But Melbourne had been in lockdown for 100 and something, 180 days, whatever, at this stage, you know, and, and, and I had months and months and months of no gigs and, and no not being allowed out for more than a couple of hours a day and you're only allowed a 5K radius and all that kind of stuff. And it was pretty oppressing, uh, you know, and, and meanwhile you're sitting there convincing yourself, you know why we're doing it, but it, it didn't stop the oppression any didn't stop that kind of getting any harder yeah um and so i hit a real dark place you know and and uh so i was looking at ways to call it a day nicely and uh which i've been through those kind of dark moments in the past as well uh but but it really kind of hit home pretty closely this time and you know, so I had to really dig deep into what was I going to do to get through this. You know, because my I've I've been through dark stuff in the past where I'd been to a psychologist who taught me it's okay to shut down every now and then and refocus on something that makes you happy. It's okay to do that. It doesn't mean you're neglecting your responsibilities or or whatever. It just it's okay to shift the gears a bit and do something that makes you happy because isn't that what we're all trying to achieve is a level of happiness and that it's okay to also exp- uh, experience okay days that uh, are real normal. No, just a bit flat. Nothing happens, you know. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we're not designed as humans to be constantly elated and getting yeah. better and better and better and always amazing, right? We, don't, we, we only aspire to that because that's what we see on social media all the time. <laughs> You're amazing. Look at this. Look where I am. Oh, you know. Um, so for me, I just thought, well, I'll shift gears. And, and so I kind of put the guitar down from playing it a bit 
and just started making them. And it gave me a completely different connection to the instrument and to, to what goes into the instrument and what, and to the woods and to the nature of woods. You know, it's not just a bit of wood you pick up from a store or anything like that. This is something that's come from a bit of land, you know, and I know my first build, I know the history of the wood behind it. I know exactly the piece of property it came from and my involvement with that property mm. in the past. Wow. That's really cool. Which was amazing. It, 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 and, and, um, you know, it, it gave me the focus I needed to keep me out of a rut and, and, um, and, it, and it energized me. It gave me a, a, a really good purpose, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't just about making a guitar, a guitar as much as it was a complete, um, uh, way to keep my soul afloat in a, in a, in a bit of an old rocky storm, yeah, you know, yeah. cause everyone says we're in the same boat. We're not, we're all in different boats, mm. same storm, different boats. Yeah. Yep. You know, it's some, good. some people are in, some people are in very safe boats with a lot of money and other people are in like dinghies with holes in them and nothing. Yeah. So, um, way. yeah. So, um, you know, but yeah, so I just loved it and it gave me such an appreciation for the extra work that goes into people who really know what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> the amount of work they've done to be able to achieve those skills, you know, it's, it's, uh, pretty cool. So anyone out there that's thinking of building a guitar, just give it a shot. What do you got to lose? Yeah. You know, it's, um, and there's, there's a lot of great guitar building courses out there too these days. You know, I've seen a lot of stuff up through, I think there's Brisbane guitar making school and there's guys through, uh, Sydney, I think that do guitar building courses and I can't recommend David Searle in Melbourne enough. Mm-hmm. Like he is just the most lovely guy and so patient, so helpful and just a, a really great teacher and person. And, um, you know, and you'd, you'd spend less learning how to build your own guitar than you would kind of going and buying a, um, you know, a, 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 a nice player series, USA Strat. Right. You know? So, yeah, yeah. So much out there for people to go and find. Yeah, yeah. Well, pedals, guitar straps, the lot. There's so many out there <laughs> building just <laughs> random associated music gear in Australia. It's great, man. And, um, yeah, I guess like mm. I said at the start, man, what, what you've done with the Australian Guitar Show uh, and your your Insta, it's, um, yeah, you've really shone a light on a lot of these guys which I'm really well, grateful you. for. And, and thank you for sharing part of your story as well, man. No, no worries. Thank you. Uh, I, I I really appreciate you kind of reaching out when you did about the Australian Guitar Show because I was kind of at a, a time in the last few, uh, in the last month or so where I was kind of ready to call it quits on social media on every level. Uh-huh. And but between yourself and a couple of other builders who reached out saying, hey, man, look, just want to encourage you uh, at the moment because – we probably wouldn't have had some of the sales or met some of the people we've met without your page or without you doing it. And it's not about my ego. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say this to stroke my ego. It was them encouraging me about what, what more it brought to them and other people than what it brought to me. Yeah. Great. And, uh, and that kind of kept me thinking, yeah, you know what, why should I delete that page? You know, it is a source of happiness. It is something that people can look at and get encouraged by and see what else is being built out there that they may not have seen otherwise. Um, you know, and so I kept that page open and, 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 and like you with your podcasts, I've actually thought, cause I can no longer go and do interviews with builders anymore without being able to travel around and a lot of visit homes and blah, blah, blah. Um, I've actually found a few guys who are keen to try out doing live stream interviews, mm-hmm. you know, so they'll be able to sit here like you and I are, which people can't see you and I talking face to face with your guitars in the background, but we could talk about those guitars specifically. So I'm going to do that same thing with these luthiers oh, is to say, look, man. why don't you grab a few of your guitars or set up in your tool shop or whatever. We'll go live on Instagram. There's no script. There's no, no editing, no nothing. We're just going to sit and chat and people can watch live. They can ask questions via the chat box and stuff like that. That's great. So I've, I, I thought, man, that's a good way. It keeps my mind active, gives me something to do while we're out here traveling and, and uh, hopefully gives uh, some more luthiers a bit of light and an opportunity for people to kind of contact and reach out to those luthiers and see uh, a bit of the process behind things as well and, and um, just make it a nice little interactive thing. So, um, so I thank you for the encouragement that when you reached out to me to say how I'd like to talk to you about your Australian guitars, it's kind of what made me go, oh, I should keep it should keep that page alive you know maybe there's more to it than just being about me being upset by a few things i'm seeing on facebook and, and instagram you know 
Yeah, oh, that's uh, awesome, so, man. That's great. Yeah, so I appreciate it, man. And you do great work, mate. I, I, I love the light that you've shed. I'm not trying to stroke your ego here either, but I really love the light you've shed on a lot of Australian players that I personally hadn't heard of because living in New Zealand for 22 years, there's a whole era of music I missed out on over there because mm-hmm. a lot of Australian bands didn't make it big there. Sure. You know, they might have they might have had a hit or two, but that'd be it. You know, so bands, band, I'd come back here and bands like Regurgitator and UMI and Ratcat and all that kind of stuff, they were stuff you'd never really heard of in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. You know, and then guys like, uh, you know, Peter Northcote and um, uh, uh, and Michael, um, was it oh, Dolce? Dolce? No, not Dolce. Yeah. Uh, yep. Dolce, Dolce. Dolce yeah. So Michael Dolce and all these other guys I'd never, not, never heard of until I, I started going through your back catalogue with your interviews. Oh, that's cool. You know, and, and and it was just great to to be able to hear those interviews and, and kind of feed into the industry a little bit through them talking about their history. Yeah, nice. So your work is is very, um, very appreciated by myself and I'm sure many, many other listeners, mate. So thank you as well. Oh, thanks, Ricky. Really appreciate it, mate. And thank you for coming on. And um, I'll put the I'll put your links in my show notes, but if people look up the Australian Guitar Show, uh, or Google Ricky Wood, R-I-C-K-I, um, they'll find me. you there. Yeah, they'll probably find me. Hopefully yeah. they find the right website. Yeah. Not the other one. Yeah. <laughs> All good. <laughs> cool, man. I was going to say dumb stuff, but I shut up. Okay. <laughs> All right, mate. <laughs> Thanks so much. Hey, right, man. Thank you. All right, mate. A pleasure. Take care. All right. There you go. Ricky Wood. Ricky is always good fun to catch up with. And, man, just such a great community builder in the guitar luthier scene of Australia. And not those guitar builders, but... Uh, all sorts of angles there and it's yeah cool to have him on the show for sure i'll leave his links in the show notes so check him out and if you're on instagram give him a follow there's also a youtube channel and uh lots of other places too where you can check out ricky's stuff all right hope you've been enjoying the show our iconic albums series continues our midweek show where i'm joined by rob Rhodes and gabor jessica we talk about some of the most influential guitar records in our collection we've got another corker episode coming up this week And, of course, our interviews, which drop pretty much on the weekends each week. So two shows every week. The best way to keep up to date is simply to subscribe to us through Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or Spotify. Wherever you podcast, you can subscribe to us there and then you get the show delivered free to your door. All right, about time for me to finish, but I always like to draw on the words of Mega Shredder the German maestro Michael Schenker, who once told me... Keep rocking, keep on rocking. Keep on rocking, indeed. I'll catch you next time. Bye now.